Okay, hi everybody. There was a chart emailed to you earlier today, um, which might be useful. Um, it's also in the chat section of Zoom, so if you don't have it easy, you can just download it from the message section in Zoom. Um, if you would prefer to just use your book, um, the same material is found on page 37. So if it's easier to just have this book open in front of you, page 37. Also, I'm going to say it out loud, so <laughs> there's also that. So some people are visual, some people are auditory, some people like charts. Try to hit all the learning styles, you know, to be a sensitive teacher. <laughs> so if you have that handout ready, and then just take a minute and settle into your space, settle into your posture. And then just set a very strong altruistic motivation. Jaya Om Mune Mune Maha Munae Soa Jaya Om Mune Mune Maha Okay, so um, last time we did um, finished up Guru Yoga and then we started on these nine analogies um, using the text by Geshe Sonam Rinchen. And I know that the, you know, the wording is a little bit scholarly, a little bit religious. Um, and um, I think sometimes it's useful to look at the kind of core way of teaching in the traditional way, rather than always looking at the most secularized, the most watered down, the most palatable, um, just so you kind of know the way things are presented traditionally. And then you can take from that what is useful to you. So if it's not all useful to you, don't worry about it. Um, but I think that there's, there's ways to touch the essence of this teaching in a way that is really inspiring. Um, and the teachings on the nine analogies or the 18 analogies, if you elaborate it out, this, this teaching came directly from Maitreya. And remember that Maitreya was, you know, is the Buddha of loving kindness and Tashita heaven who inspired the mind of a Sangha after he had spent all that time in retreat. And, um, and so these analogies, I think, evoke a great meaning to us because of their imagery. Um, and they're all kind of saying versions of a theme. You know, they're all versions of the theme, which is basically your nature is perfect, pure, able to be developed exponentially into perfection. That is your nature. That is everyone's nature. Currently, it is obscured by negative states of mind, by suffering, by ignorance, by karmic seeds but that doesn't destroy the essence, right? So all of them are basically saying versions of a theme, but they're pointing out specific nuances of both the perfection and the affliction, the perfected aspect and the affliction. So um, looking at the more subtle nuances of it can help us kind of touch and penetrate the teachings more deeply. So it's very poetic and um, quite, uh, you know, of its time. Uh, but I think that a lot of the analogies are still quite relatable um, and the imagery is still quite relatable. So before we kind of jump into unpacking these and we'll just go through them gradually and see how many we get through today and we might finish today or we might finish Wednesday. We'll just kind of see. So interrupt me if you have questions or interesting ideas that come up as we go through each one, just jump in. Um, but before we go into it, did you have any hanging questions from our previous sessions that you wanted to flesh out?
before we move on, stuff about um, guru yoga from the sutra perspective or the tantric perspective or the two different versions of the tantric perspective? Um, I can tell um, something uh, very personal that uh, I have uh, a lot of uh, difficulties with uh, uh, the high level of the English. And um, there are a lot of words that I, I don't understand. And then I stop to look in the iPhone, the, um, the morphix traduction. And then I, I can come back because you, you are very quick. And uh, I find myself in the, in the end of the lesson. Um, um, little overwhelmed yeah yeah yep yeah that's totally fair enough yeah it's so, fair enough. so if if it's okay from your side maybe in in your intuition if there is a word that you think that might be uh difficult for uh so uh, maybe you can give us few words that is synonym sure yeah sure I by, by your intuition because i i won't uh, every every time uh, tell uh, tell you that i don't understand because uh, i don't want to interrupt and everything sure so if it's okay yeah yeah um know that a lot of the time i do give a lot of synonyms and i say the same thing in many different ways so maybe you get lost say, thinking that i'm saying many different things when i'm actually saying the same thing in many different ways hoping that one of them will make sense to you guys because i know you know using a second language has got to be difficult um, for sure so um sometimes it's a lot of words because i'm trying to say the same thing in a lot of different ways yeah, yeah but definitely especially when it's uh, poetry sure right poetry is harder is it yeah of course oh interesting <laughs> good to know to me to me maybe yeah no no I, I don't think you're alone i don't think you're alone and you know of course poetry itself is more than the words so then you don't even you know necessarily um, interpret the words even if you know the language really well because exactly. who knows what the poet's trying to say yeah yeah, for sure. No, that's good feedback. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, and, um, you know, my, my way of speaking English is probably a little bit odd, <laughs> you know, so um, yeah, it takes some getting used to. Yeah, and there's certain things I can adjust. And there's certain things that are just the way I speak and, you know, what to do. Um, at the end of the day, you know, what we're talking about are versions of a theme you know, versions of a theme. The point being that there are different things that activate your Buddha nature, and there are certain things that suppress it or cloud it. And that's basically the only thing we're talking about this semester, right? That's what we're talking about the whole time. And so it's just versions of that. Um, because the concept, you can just say, oh yeah, that makes sense. Just like in the world, you know, there are things that make you more intelligent, wise, and empathic. And are, there are things that will make you less wise, less empathic. And, you know, how do we work with conditions? So, you know, you could say that and then we're done and, you know, the whole class is done because we can explain it in five minutes. The question is, how do you process things that make sense intellectually? You know, and the way that we process things that we understand intellectually is either to do them or to talk about them or to meditate deeply on them. So if you're never talking about them and you're not doing meditations on them and they're not practices that you do because you're not sure if you want to do them yet, it's going to be more confusing. So it's not like by not interacting or not doing the meditations, you're bad or a bad student. It just means that it's going to be less quick and less effective unless you do your own taking responsibility for your own path and taking responsibility for your own learning. Because it's much different than rote learning or just content based learning. Um, you really have to take the ideas into yourself and process them in some way for there to come to be some, I don't know, understanding that's deeper than raw knowledge, something that's experiential. Yeah. So please 
I know um, how it is to be in a class when you are an introvert or you are someone who is a good listener. I mean, as much as you hear me talk, I actually don't talk in social situations easily and I don't speak up in class often. That's not who I am as a student. So I understand being that kind of student that just likes to sit back and kind of listen and process and just kind of see. But over time, I've kind of gotten myself a little bit more, um, I don't know, brave is the wrong word, but just a little bit more assertive about my own process to ask questions in class. It's really encouraged in the Tibetan tradition, especially because you're not learning formalized debate. So instead of debate, we have to have discussion and interaction and processing things that way. So even though it's not necessarily any of our natural way to speak up in class, maybe none of us were that kid in class, right? It's quite possible because you're all kind of therapeutically minded healery types, right? Like myself. So you, probably none of us were like the big chatty one in class going through school. Um, Dharma class, Dharma students, we have to kind of engage with material a little bit more assertively to pull it apart because a lot of the concepts make sense on the surface quite quickly but how do you ever practice them unless you pull them apart and look at all the angles i um wanted to tell that um in intuitively uh when in meditations uh uh the nuns you and uh, other nuns told us to think about uh, like the medicine Buddha or other, some other Buddha and to feel her uh, radiation. So sometimes intuitively I would think about, I couldn't imagine Tara or some other, and intuitively I would think about um, uh, the nun who was uh, giving us the, and, uh, but I felt Oh, I, I felt it was helpful, but I felt it was also, maybe it's not right, maybe it's awkward. So now it helped me very much to feel it was intuitively right and like it's legitimate. It's not only like my mind, maybe I, I was doing something not okay, so. Really yeah, yeah, you were, you were intuiting the way that it winds up going. Of course, with, the, with us, nuns, even if we have students, and some of us do and some of us don't, and there's variations of what relationship of student we have, none of us are in a formalized student-teacher relationship in the Human Spirit program because it's a secular program. So if anyone was to become anyone's teacher, it would have to be a conversation and it would have to be a long conversation and you know stuff like that. So we're nominally your teacher, like a university professor. And we're your Dharma friend, right? We're your Dharma Sangha. Um, you know, we're completely your nurses here for you always, but we're not your teacher, right? We're not the doctor in the formalized sense. But the way that you're thinking about it in meditation is going that direction um, in terms of the teacher and the deity become oneness. That's exactly where it goes. And the personification, you know, the kind of lived quality of the enlightened mind, whether it takes the form of medicine Buddha or Tara or whoever, the way to kind of relate to that is by thinking about the teachers that have taught you about it and the qualities that you particularly resonate with, which really means you're resonating with your own qualities in their developmental stages, as well as your qualities as they develop. You know, so it's, it becomes quite a rich process. And I think that your mind is probably going the right way with it, even if it's, you know, still kind of working itself out in terms of details. It's odd to think, okay, here's this iconography, or here's this art, or here's this image, and now suddenly it's supposed to mean something to me when I didn't grow up with it. It's supposed to mean something to me, even though it's not my religion or my path. And maybe even you grew up with a religion that said iconography is bad, right? So there's some old, you know, resistances about iconography just in general. And then you're like, all right, well, but yeah, love is good. Healing is good. Compassion is good. I'll put aside my doubts and I'll just try and relate to that. But what am I relating to? And then you do have to think about your own relationships with mentors, um, with teachers, and the way in which you've touched those qualities in their human form. And then you can kind of imbue that imagery with those ideas and it becomes a lot more relatable. And that is kind of going in the direction of guru yoga for sure. And is why it becomes more powerful and more 
connected because it's not just some abstract, yep, love, good, whatever. You know, you actually can feel a relationship happening and a connection happening and developing. So in a secular way, uh, I also think that we have uh, uh, the analysts, we have the supervisors, and we have the teachers, and, uh, and we have the nuns. And, and I feel that also that I'm trying to um, sometimes to like make oneness from from them like I, I if the if if i know my analyst uh, and my supervisor <coughs> thinks the same way or uh, or who or i'm thinking was he who was who was his analyst and uh, like i i but if it makes me a, a good feeling even if it's only my thoughts and i don't know what uh, but if there is conflict, then like I, my analyst, I feel that he does it, that he thinks differently. So, and it's difficult to make this oneness. So this is a bit uh, more difficult when you feel that there is not a harmony that you can make, uh, create like a oneness and that you feel that you can um, be receptive to all. Of, if if it, there's, it's not, you feel something not mm -hmm harmonious uh. yeah for sure for sure and you know that feeling of maybe oneness and connectedness in a way is is related to your own feeling of reconciliation and resonance with all of the different parts of the path coming together within you you know and where there is harmony within you with all of these ideas even ideas that are on the surface contradictory maybe one school of thought is saying there is a self that needs to be understood nourished propagated the other side saying sorry no not not at all not in any way there is no self like that so you know maybe two sides sound on the surface to be saying something contradictory like that but within you you're touching the deeper essence of both of them and then it's an inner reconciliation that understands, I don't know, something like whatever the relative self is, does need to be understood. The behaviors and ideas and attitudes of that relative self need to be understood and not jumped over in order to move on to the step of seeing that it's all dependently arisen, which is why it's empty. And then you come into some sort of inner harmony with it, even though the different people aren't necessarily in harmony with each other. It becomes this inner harmony, which then you can mirror as an outer harmony in the depiction of the Buddha in front of you or the light in front of you. And it becomes this collaborative resonance or a positive feedback loop that reinforces itself. Because the guru-ness is something subtler and deeper than the actual person you're bouncing off of. Mm. They're kind of like the mouthpiece for it, but it doesn't have to, everything doesn't have to be in harmony because you're touching something deeper than that, which is really, you know, in a way, your mind's own ability to hear deeply different layers of wisdom and respond to them. Mm -hmm. It's very tricky, but the, what you're describing in a way of remembering the teacher and their teacher and their teacher and their teacher is also very much intuitively the way that we work in Tantra because we're remembering the unbroken lineage of teachings from the time of the Buddha and imagining that unbroken stream from the Buddha to his students, to his students, to his students, all the way to your teacher, to you, is coming in an unbroken flow, bringing blessings and realizations to you, which really just means that your mind's ability to be inspired and transformed. Mm -hmm. A blessing is really just your mind transforming and being inspired. So requesting blessing is like requesting inspiration or openness to shift. Yeah, but so yeah, there's some there's some stuff that's coming kind of organically just by going through the structure of it. You're understanding some of the background ideas behind it, and I think that's cool. It's very cool. Yeah, Rachali, did you have something? Yes, I thought that maybe the development is from uh, the Sutra Guru that the Guru rep represent the Buddha to the Tantra Guru that the Guru is the Buddha. That maybe this is the way it. That it's in steps like that? Yes, that it, you, know, you don't stay in a sutra guru, but you will have uh, maybe minutes in your life or, or all your life you will feel that uh, the tantra guru later. Yep, yeah, exactly like that. 
Yeah, exactly like that. And, you know, some people in some lives stay at just one level with it the whole time and it's very enriching and nourishing and they don't have to move on into the deeper and subtler forms of the tantric view. It might be too, I don't know, abstract or ambiguous or, you know, something that doesn't sit well with them. And so then they just operate the sutra guru version of the relationship and still there's huge development, but certainly in terms of practice, processes it is seen linear like that like first do this then do this and you know eventually everythingness yeah it's linear i thought uh, that i've uh, maybe sensed uh, some of the difference between uh, the sutra guru and the tantra guru in meditation once i visualize the guru the buddha or the clear light in front of me and once I uh, visualize it, uh, uh, you know, uh, yeah, crown of your head, upon the crown of my head, and maybe uh, when it, uh, when I visualize it in front of me, it was more like sutra. Yeah. Uh, that uh, it bring the it radiate towards me, but it's still another source in a way. Yeah. And when it was uh, up my my head, it was like. Uh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well spotted. <laughs> That's exactly it. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, intuitively, a lot of these connections get made within us, even without them being explicitly explained. I think part of us gets it. Um, and a lot of uh, sutra level practices um, are very much that space in front imagery and in tantric practices coming to the crown of the head at some point. And then when you're empowered or initiated and have made the formalized relationship, then that crown of the head dissolves into you and you become it. But that's, um, that's only once you've made these relationships and you have this you know, connection with refuge and the three principal aspects of the path and you've sussed out a good teacher and all of that, then you do this dissolution and arising process yourself. But, um, but all of us can do that shift of out in the space in front than coming to the crown of the head that just closer, you know, closer and closer until eventually merging. Yeah, it's, it's interesting stuff, but it can be quite confronting um, and it can be misunderstood. And so we don't want to force anything for sure. Definitely keep, keep asking questions, yeah. I wanted to ask what you said about um, the teacher's qualities that are actually your qualities and um, Trying to kind of whose qualities are they? <laughs> Not that yeah. you need to figure out, or, but that something in the the feeling. What What do you think about it? Kind of, the teacher's qualities that are actually your qualities. There's something yeah. about that the teacher brings out the qualities in you. Actually, you're not really. Um, you're not taking on the teacher's qualities, maybe you're taking on your qualities. Yeah, it, I mean, there's, there is a lot of conversation about what you're talking about, that, that both the qualities and the faults that you see in the teacher are very much reflective of your qualities and your faults, you know? And, um, and that we, when we find a resonance with a teacher, it's often with a teacher that already has qualities that we have, but are in there more child form and they have the more developed form but they're the same qualities and you'll notice that students who have a teacher in common there is something similar about them that's kind of hard to put your finger on but um i don't know some of the cohort one students met met my teacher in my community in india and i'm curious if they felt the sameness of us even though we are from different countries and different cultures you know a whole bunch of vietnamese folks and south african folks and americans and australians um, and you know monks and nuns and all different kinds of nuns ages but still somehow there's something similar about us and we all have you know we all have the same teacher and it's kind of hard to put your finger on um, but there is something in that ranan yeah I would like to emphasize that this kind of sameness or of uh, reflections from the disciple to, to his uh, guru is not uh, under the psychoanalytic definition 
let's uh, look at it and see it not as a projections from me to as I'm seeing my guru, but as a stages and signs of the processes of dissolving. How much I'm uh, reflected in my guru or how much I'm uh, seen by other uh, friend, the Dharma friend, as reflecting some sameness, for me it's signs of the process of dissolving, the process of transforming the mind of the disciple. It's not an a priori sameness. It might be a karmic uh, sameness from, from the beginning, but if it's a kind of a processing, then it's a sign, signing something which is going on well in the process of idealizing, in the sense of uh, giving myself into the process of dissolving. And what is uh, majorly important that it's not a phantasmatic product. It's not a projected product of my mind. It's something which really, uh, really uh, depict, depicting the, the, the process itself that goes on between the two, the two uh, minds of the disciple and the guru. It's interesting. Yeah. The, yeah. It's, and I don't know enough about this concept of dissolving to speak to that at all, but it, it's, it is something like, like what you're describing. I think you're right. Um, and I, I don't know what parallels there are with the analyst and analyzant relationship, you know, or if, if they're perfectly similar or if there's some differences or not, but, you know, it's, it's also the case that there's a, you know, a co-mirroring of this, the, the teacher begins to mirror the students in certain ways and adopt certain, I don't know, senses of humor or, um, I don't know, ways of entertaining themselves or, you know, whatever that are somehow to relate to the students. Um, and, and, you know, and it is interesting because I, if I see my teacher with his Western students, even though a lot of them are Eastern, his, <laughs> his Western Eastern students, um, or with his Tibetan students who he taught in the monastery for many years before he moved to Australia, he, he does have a slightly different aspect because different things are expected of him in terms of relatability, you know? So when he's with his like Tibetan disciples, he is a lot more formal. Um, he's a lot more the Lama, you know? And he, he, even his posture is a little bit more straight and he walks, you know, in a kind of more formal way. And then when he's with us, he knows that we are less fond of formality and he might just, you know, lounge on the couch you know, put an arm up and, you know, be a little bit more the, the postures and mannerisms of Westerners. And um, I, I always think that's quite interesting as well, whether that's something that he's choosing to do or that's something that is coming naturally by his interaction with us or what exactly is happening there. But it is quite interesting. And I guess, you know, when you're looking for a teacher, then what qualities are you looking for? It is a type of familiarity. You know, you're looking for a type of familiarity that's hard to put your finger on. But, you know, if you saw four teachers in front of you with identical ethics and identical education and identical realizations, but different personalities, of course you would have an affinity with one more than the other, even though they're all equally qualified. So it's that kind of like affinity, familiarity, recognition feeling that's a big piece in deciding who is my guru as opposed to who is a good guru, but not mine. You know, there's a type of resonance. Yeah. Um, when I first met my teacher and he was teaching, the feeling was relief, you know, like, oh, he's making sense. He's making sense. But he was more than making sense. He was making sense in this very deep way where I could hear my own clarity better when he was in front of me. And then when I bring the sense of him to the space in front or the sense of him to, uh, to above my head in the form of whatever deity, that same process happens even though he's not physically in the room. So that's kind of, yeah, getting into understanding guru yoga. Yeah, yeah, any other thoughts before we do um, analogies? You can bring it up again, but we're done with it as a topic. So moving on. 
Um, if you want to look at your chart or look at page, um, what is it, 37, either one. Um, we're going to start with the analogy of this like ugly lotus concealing the form of a Buddha. This is the first analogy or the first two analogies if you split them into two. So what you've got is, it becomes like an ugly lotus, but it starts as like just a beautiful flower and inside of it is the image of the Buddha. And this is representing to us the seeds of attachment that bring rebirth in the form and formless realms. So like latent desire, yeah? And the way to think of it is that on the surface, the flower is so beautiful and its, and its petals are so finely formed and we're so attracted to the beauty of it in the same way that we're attracted to the pleasures and the beauty and the allure of samsara. Yeah, so we're looking at the petals and we're forgetting that it's a flower that will die. We're forgetting that it's something that will wilt. You know, we're thinking that this is it, I've got it. And because we're so fixated on the petals and the beauty, we don't seek with what is within, which is the true source of lasting happiness. So this lotus analogy, lotus obscuring the image of the Buddha, is, is really showing us the way in which attachment prevents progress. Yeah, because the things that we exaggerate, the things that we think are good from their own side, the things that we assume permanence of and cling to because of that, we, get, we lose our whole lives in pursuit of those things, will, which will eventually wilt and die and fail us. And because we don't kind of, you know, go through the petals into the core of it and see the lasting potentiality, we miss out. So we're just chasing and picking flowers and picking flowers and picking flowers rather than creating something more stable based on the inner seed of it that's always there. So does that, that analogy kind of make sense to you? Yeah, so the outside of the lotus is beautiful and tempting, but it's just gonna wilt and die. But we spend our whole life obsessed with the outside of it and never penetrate the core where the real happiness will be and is. Yeah. Um, and so the inside of it, the Buddha within it, um, in this particular analogy, we're talking about the Buddha nature that can become the truth body. Um, so the Dharmakaya the truth body of realization. And it's related to people, ordinary people in formless realms. And of the three kind of realms of existence, desire realm, that's us, form and formless realms are mental states where you've achieved calm abiding and above. So you've achieved perfect single pointed concentration and it's become so stable that it's effortless. And once your mind is able to concentrate in that perfect, pure way, but perfectly pure in the sense of concentration, when your mind can do that, it's very blissful. It's so blissful to be in that concentrated state that it doesn't often occur to you to then work on the other qualities or to think of others. Yeah, it's a little bit like if you were sucked into something on television, yeah, or sucked into a book. You know, as opposed to just watching it or reading it with some mental space, you know, the two different ways of watching, right? So there could be the case where you're watching or reading and your partner or your kid comes up to you and says, hey, we need more milk, whatever. And you can just turn to them without uh, kind of a feeling of interruption and just go, oh yeah, we'll get it tomorrow. And then keep doing what you're doing. There's the other case when you're like sucked in, right? When you're like absorbed and someone comes and talks to you and you're sort of startled and you feel interrupted and there's that jolt, yeah? So when you're fully absorbed, it's quite blissful, isn't it? Right, there's, there's an aspect of that watching or that reading or that merging with the concentration object that gives the mind real satisfaction and relief and you're in the zone, yeah? And so that kind of bliss is a bliss of concentration for us ordinary people, but when it's developed, it's even more blissful and you're even more in the zone and even less likely to think of others and to feel interrupted by them, yeah? Or to feel jolted by them, yeah? That, that sort of altruistic quality, that empathic quality 
is shut down when you develop these higher levels of realization without bodhicitta, right? Which is why we hammer bodhicitta from the very beginning, because if you develop your mental abilities without developing your heart, you just get lost in the fun of spiritual entertainment and how neat it is to have better concentration. And it's just for you and your own sake. And anyway, it's gonna wear off because you're gonna run out of merit, right? So these form and formless realms, they're so tempting. They're so tempting. They're, you know, they're realms, but they're mental states. And we can see a version of that tendency in ourselves in the desire realm being that we are right now. We can see that tendency to like to get lost in something that we're concentrated on. Even if it's a virtuous-ish something, that kind of tunnel vision where you just can't be bothered by anyone else, there's a selfishness to it, isn't there? Right, and kind of a self-centeredness to it. If you're remembering altruism, you can get into that same zone, but not feel interrupted or jolted when something else needs your attention. Am I, is it making sense? Yeah. So for us to kind of prevent the tendency to get lost in the form and formless realms as our meditation abilities develop, for us to prevent that tendency, we just need to keep remembering altruism with everything that we're doing so that when what we're doing is enjoyable for us, that enjoyment doesn't make us forget others. It doesn't mean we don't get to have enjoyment of it. You'll actually have more enjoyment of it if you don't feel interrupted when other things pull your focus, right? But um, yeah, just kind of remember those times when you've been really absorbed in what you're doing or thinking or watching or reading. You're so absorbed, but it's, it's gotten a little bit of barriers to it. So much so that anything else needing your attention feels like a violation or an intrusion. Yeah. If you go into that same activity thinking, I'm doing this for the welfare of all sentient beings, if other sentient beings need you, your mind remains flexible enough to turn towards that without feeling aggravated. Yeah, so, so that's a little bit about that one. Um, then the swarm of bees is talking about anger, right? So the swarm of bees is concealing the honey. Yeah, so the swarm of bees concealing the honey, the honey at the center of it, of the center of the hive is beautiful and sweet and delicious. And that's the Buddha nature that we're talking about. And this can become, um, this is talking about ultimate truth, the emptiness of inherent existence, specifically of the mind. Yeah, so the honey is talking about the emptiness of inherent existence. And there is a saying that we say a lot in practice, which is that everything is one taste in emptiness. Everything is one taste in emptiness. And if in the back of your mind you think, and that taste is honey, <laughs> then it's going to be more um, intriguing for you because of the sweetness and the joy that comes from letting go of grasping at inherent existence. Yeah, then infinite possibility is open to you and it's a joyful thing. So emptiness can sound like this cold space, vacuum, something. It can feel like an empty, empty rather than a spaciousness of infinite possibility where all of the sweetness and possibilities are accessible to you. So that beautiful sweetness, the, the sweetness of ultimate truth, right? The honey of emptiness is covered by a swarm of angry bees that make you unable to see it or access it. And when you come close to it, you get stung. Yeah, and this is what anger does to us is that we get so ready to attack yeah, that we might just be kind of, you know, a rumbling swarm of bees full of our own irritation and annoyance and just a little bit discontent. But then as soon as something comes close to us, we sting. You know, so it's uncomfortable even all by yourself, but then other people are likely to get harmed as well, the closer they get to you when you're in this obscuration. So this is talking about latent anger. So the anger that hasn't necessarily arisen in this moment, because we're still talking about ordinary beings of the form and formless realms, but the potentiality exists there. Even though you're happy in your spacious, blissful mind, you have done nothing to confront desire or anger. You just kind of put a lid on it and are abiding in the bliss of concentration. No work is getting done. So it's like, 
the possibility to get fixated in the lotus or to get lost in the swarm of angry bees remains unless you deal with the seeds and the habits of those negative states of mind. Yeah, so does that one make sense, swarm of bees? Yeah. So there's the kind of, you know, technical reference that it's talking to, and then there's this the kind of poetic aspect of thinking about how do we identify the self? And the self is empty of inherent existence. And to think of that as the core of you, even though there is no solid permanent unitary core, but you know, nominally the core of you is this beautiful Buddha, this beautiful sweet honey, this nourishing grain, this treasure or gold or tree or whatever the analogy is, this beauty is always there and it gets obscured by so many different things born from ignorance. So if you're thinking about your daily life in terms of what covering am I overly identifying with? Yeah, because the real place to put any sense of identity is on the mere eye, that which is merely labeled on the collection of body and mind. That's you, right? Nothing wrong with that, but we're lost on the outside and identified on the outside and on things that are temporary and removable is who we think we are. And so removing any kind of affliction or tendency of affliction feels like we're getting rid of ourselves and it makes us afraid or defensive. When in fact, it was the very thing blocking us from developing the, the beauty. Yeah. So if you're in your desire mind, you can think, oh, I'm getting obsessed by the beauty of the lotus, forgetting the Buddha within. When if you're feeling angry, you can think I'm getting lost in the swarm of bees, forgetting the honey at its center. Um, so then the husk, this is talking about, um, you know, the covering on a grain, you know, like for example, a barley grain, where the outside of it is not nutritious, the outside of it is just a covering and it has uh, no nutritional value and it's just kind of like papery substance on the outside of a grain. And so the husk is um, relating to the seeds of ignorance that bring rebirth in the form and formless realms, these, this latent ignorance. And then um, the purified aspect is the naturally pure Buddha essence um, related to the teachings on the conventional. And um, this one is also related to ordinary beings in the form and formless realms. So the first three are going through desire, anger, ignorance, related to the latency that hasn't kind of popped up causing obvious trouble, but the potential for it exists even while you're kind of abiding in bliss. So, um, so if you can, you know, thinking in terms of just ordinary everyday walking around poetry of it, um, the grain is nourishing, right? The grain gives you health, the, the grain gives you energy. That's your Buddha nature. The outside, the husk, has nothing to do with the grain, really. It served a function maybe long ago, but it's no longer needed. And if you try to, I don't know, eat the outside of it, you're not going to get any benefit. And if you think the outside of it is, is, is it, you're missing the core of it. You're missing the point of it. Yeah. So like this. Um, questions on husk? Good. So then uh, the next analogy is uh, the heap of filth obscuring gold. Yeah, so this is like um, a garbage heap that has gold in the bottom of it. And you don't know that there's gold there. So you never dig through the garbage heap because it's just disgusting and repulsive and you don't want to dig through it. Um, but if you knew there was gold there, you would make the effort, you know? So if you knew there was gold at the bottom of a garbage heap, you would put up with the smell. Yeah, you would put up with your aversion because you know you were getting to something. But sometimes we are preventing ourselves from developing because we don't really have confidence that there's anything at the bottom of it. Yeah, we're so identified with the surface garbage that even the idea of digging through it and releasing all the horrible smells and toxins that have been brewing over time, it's just like, no way. Yeah, but if we really knew that there was gold down there, we'd put up with it. So similarly, like on your meditation cushion, if you really believed that not following your distractions, that staying awake and clear, that 
actively engaging your focus would lead to better concentration and a better daily life, better concentration, less mistakes in your daily life, better concentration as a platform to develop higher realizations. If you really believe that, and you're really convinced of that in the moment, then when the temptation of get going off with distractions arises, you just say, not now, and you come back. But a lot of the time in meditation, we're like, I feel a distraction, and I'm not really sure this meditation is gonna work anyway, and so I'm going with the distraction. Yeah, you know, this happens, it's really normal, it's human. But the reason we give in to the distraction is that we're not fully convinced that development is possible. Yeah, or it's too hard, or um, it might not work for us because we're a special case of the only being on earth that can't be enlightened. We're the special one who will never be enlightened. Cockroaches can get enlightened, but not us. Yeah, we're the special case. Um, you know, there's a lot of reasons why we might give up on the path. But it is kind of um, at the basis of it is, do you really believe change is possible? It's quite interesting to sit with. And so, we, you know, when you're doing meditation, if you can prepare your mind before you meditate well, prepare it with, why am I doing this? Set your motivation. It seems artificial and orchestrated and forced sometimes, but it clicks you back into the whole point of it. Yeah, which then means that when you actually meditate, you'll stay with it. So like I've said many times, being distracted is not a bad meditation. Indulging distraction is a bad meditation. Being distracted is fine. Allowing it, giving into it, when you notice I am distracted and I don't care, that's a bad meditation. If you go, I am distracted, whoops, come on back. Good meditation. So it's not about not being distracted. You're gonna be distracted for ages. Just don't give in, right? For once, for five minutes, for 30 minutes, try not to give in, yeah? You know, break the habit, break the circuit of constantly needing to be stimulated and entertained by things that are afflictive and just reinforce the wheel. Yeah. So this one is talking now about manifest afflictions. Right, the heap of filth is manifest afflictions, meaning those that are present right now, not just latent or sleeping or dormant, but the ones in your face every day. And that's why it's like a heap of filth, you know, stinky and smelly and obvious and unavoidable. That is the state of affairs in our daily life. And our afflictions not, might not be, I guess, that obvious or overwhelming if our main affliction is ignorance, right? Kind of a vague dullness we can get away with in polite society. And that's the affliction that a lot of adults give themselves permission to live in. Kind of a spacey, dull, vague, half present, sleepy space. Or just like mildly irritated all the time, or like mildly needy all the time, but you're still polite. And so no one would say you're afflicted because you're presenting very peaceful, you're presenting very open and kind, but there's just a background sort of something. Yeah, just like, I need more, or this is too much, right? Too much, not enough, too much, not enough, right? Just quietly or loudly in the background, or I don't even really know what's happening, I'm just trying to get through it. Also that, <laughs> right? So it doesn't seem like a stinky heap of filth, but it is because we're not then digging down to touch the gold there. Yeah, so manifest afflictions. So they bring about rebirth into the desire realm, which is where we are now. And um, the gold represents the emptiness of the mind, the suchness of the mind, meaning the fact that the mind lacking inherent existence is why it's transformable. So questions about filth and gold? Or ideas that come up when we think about that one? Yeah? In this continuation, the three poisonous emotions manifesting strongly. What does it mean, the three poisonous? What you said before, desire, anger, and uh, ignorance? Yep, exactly. Exactly. Whenever you see three poisons, um, referring to those three. Yep. 
Yeah, I don't know if you remember the, the class that we did on the 12 links of dependent arising. It was just one class, but the core had like three animals, you know, a bird, a snake, and a pig, representing the three poisons, anger, attachment, ignorance, basically being the battery or the, you know, energy generator or the starting point for all other afflictions. Everything else is a version of one of those three. Yeah. So if you think about any of your stuff, you know, any of your afflictions, it's basically boiling down to get it away. I want more. I don't know. <laughs> right? It's boiling down to one of those three versions of that. So even if it seems kind of fancy, sophisticated baggage, it's basically one of those three. So the three poisons are those. Um, okay, so earth and treasure is talking about the ground of the latencies of ignorance that create unpolluted karma. So the imprints of ignorance. And this is talking about basically hearers and solitary realizers or practitioners of the foundational vehicle. So practitioners of the foundational vehicle get a huge amount done and achieve very high realizations as the result of their path, but it's not done. Because what they're left with when they achieve nirvana are the imprints. All right, so we have karmic seeds and we have karmic imprints, right? And there's a difference between them. Karmic seeds are like the latencies or the potencies that ripen into the contaminated happiness of samsara or ripen into the suffering of samsara or ripen into the neutrality of samsara. But they ripen into experience. Mainly our mental and physical feelings is where old karma ripens. Yeah, as well as environmental and behavioral and those different aspects of karma, right? That's what the seeds do. Now the imprints are basically the habits of those or um, the remnants of those or the tendency to see things as inherently existent. So you might see things as inherently existent, but once you've realized emptiness and you've developed along the, to the foundational path of meditation, you don't believe it anymore, right? Things appear truly existent, they appear inherently existent, but you don't believe it. But that appearance is coming from the imprints, which means you're not fully omniscient, yet fully able to see everything simultaneously at all times, which means you're not able to benefit sentient beings in a complete way because there's still things obscuring your ability and your mind. Does that make sense? So what we're talking about here is these latencies of imprints that still need to be removed even after you've achieved nirvana. You need more to achieve full, complete Buddhahood. Okay, so that's um, all the time we have for today. Um, take a minute and dedicate the energy you put into the class to developing that Buddha nature to benefit all sentient beings. Thanks, guys. Thank you.